Hello? Hi, is that Jay? Yes. Hi, Jay. Uh, you're live on Chick Rotten and Roll with the Hunky Tonk Man. Oh, uh, how's it going? Going good. Going uh, very good, my cheese mo. Oh, boy. Honky, I uh, think uh, first I got to start by saying, because if I don't say it, they're listening and they'll kill me. Uh, I, myself, along with Sanjay Dutt and Frankie Kazarian, are three of the biggest Honky Tonk Man fans this world has ever seen. I mean, the honky, Frankie Kazarian and I, and Honky, you know Frankie. I know Frankie very well. Yeah, we have listened to, and uh, we are very proud of the fact that we have listened to every single Honky Tonk Man shoot out there, whether it be with RF video or the kayfabe commentaries. We have listened to it all more than once, by the way. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was with TNA, we went overseas, to uh, Amsterdam, no, we went through Amsterdam, sorry, we were somewhere in uh, England, and uh, a bunch of the guys went out, and you know, it, it's, I mean, if that's not your thing to go out and drink, then I, in the wrestling business, it's kind of tough, uh, but uh, when you get somebody like Frank Azarian, who's willing to stay back in the room with you, and just listen to every honky-tonk interview possible, just to pass some time, then you're pretty good. <laughs> well, I, uh, at least I touched your life in a way that was uh, positive by, by you're not going out and having a, f- a few uh, cocktails with the boys because uh, you could have ended up with Ric Flair's uh, uh, bar bill. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I'm really glad that, that uh, you know, you guys have, have done so well. And I remember Frankie from way back when he was first breaking in and everything and, and, and uh, I ran across you a few times too, but I oh, you yeah. know, it was it was one of those things where, you know, you weren't the, that big star you are now. So oh please, <laughs> but uh, you you made a you made a, a a a big move from TNA over to Ring of Honor now, which I think is a, a positive move for you. I think you'll have fun over there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and it's a, it's a new experience too. As far as the wrestling business goes in general, Honky, because I'm sure uh, you realize there's a, a couple guys out there, and uh, I'm not included in them. I'm actually included in the group that does believe that, you know, wrestling is changing, and the times are changing, and it's time for change. And Ring of Honor is mostly reaching out to that UFC-style uh, audience because, I mean, it's 100% competition is what they try to base their product around. And, of course, we're still going to have wrestling fans because the words wrestling are in there, and, and we got wrestlers, and it, it is wrestling, but, you know, we're we're trying to base it more on directing it towards the UFC-style fans, the competition drivers. Yeah, the uh, fellas over there, uh, you know, they're they're doing a great job, and and uh, Sheldon Benjamin's over there, and uh, Charlie Haas, yeah. and, Oh, of speaking, not to cut you off, I'm sorry, Hungry, but you mentioned Shelton Benjamin. I was listening earlier before I called, and you had mentioned uh, the Nigeria trip, and I, I believe Shelton was on that. I think he was. Yes, he was. I didn't have the complete list of everyone, but what a yeah. mess. I mean. Oh, my goodness. They called and asked me to do it, and uh, I didn't turn him down. I actually sent them to uh, Bill Barron's because uh, he actually is handling all my bookings. But uh, they they talked to Bill Barons and then they tried to talk to me and I kept trying to send them back to Bill Barons and it just never worked out. And uh, Shelton was he kept telling me, yeah, I'm going. I went on the last one. It was pretty good. You should give give it a shot. Come on with us. We had fun. And it just still never panned out. So boy, did I dodge a bullet on that one. Yeah, I I, I just uh, as you heard me talking, uh, I've been invited to that thing a, a couple of times and. Now that this has happened, uh, I I I've, I don't mind going to Canada or the United Kingdom yeah, or, right. or or Europe or somewhere, but I'm not going to go to down to to the Africa, Nigeria. Right, or something right. Like it's that. a it's a different world. It's a different world out there, Anki. You know, look what happened to the, the WWE guys down in uh, Cape Town or Johannesburg or somewhere. They get down there and all their bag their bags of all all the stuff's taken out of their bags. Jeez. This is a crazy world, and, and, and they don't have the security that we're, that we're used to at the airports and things oh, like that. Oh or, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. So it, it it's it's totally a different world. It's one of those that I don't like to f- play around with. So uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like going off the top rope. Uh, I tell people anything, 
Any, anything above that second rope is, uh, is, is, is a death-defying act for me. Uh, and you know, uh, Honky, uh, one of the quotes that uh, Frankie Gazarian and I share on in many a locker room when we, we hear guys going over their matches and it, it just sounds a little much and like somebody may get hurt, we'll make sure we won't talk to him directly, but out loud we'll go, hey, remember that uh, what, what Honky said about the ropes? And Frankie will go, yeah, I asked him, uh, how are the ropes honking? And Honky replies, well, I don't know, I don't touch them. <laughs> well, that's true. That is absolutely true. That that it, that is the truth. Uh, and, uh, yeah, someone did ask me that, and Frankie uh, was around, and he heard that, and uh, and I said it. Uh, I said, uh, I, someone said, how, how are the ropes, ring ropes out there? I, said, I don't know. I don't touch them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh man! But, but the, you know, that's the part of the business. That's the fun part. And oh and, yeah. Some of the other nonsense that goes on, and and you've been involved in it. You know, we're not big, big fans of TNA here on this show for several reasons. Of course, right. you know, uh, Hogan and and, and bitch off, and uh, we don't call him <laughs> bitch off. We call him bitch off. And I noticed, and, and I had a question about that, if you don't mind, Honky. <laughs> go, go right ahead. Okay, uh, I, I was wondering if you could uh, just enlighten me just a little bit. You don't got to go into full detail about the problem with you and Eric Bischoff, because I did notice, uh, you know, when I was doing the whole Macho Man character in TNA, uh, they, they didn't really give me a script for anything, because, I mean, Savage would just say a lot of times some pretty off-the-wall stuff, so I was always allowed to say whatever I wanted, and a lot of times in the middle of a promo or a pre-tape, I'd just shout out a random wrestler's name and ask, where is he, like, where's Kamala, or something like that, and I remember doing it, one time, this is after Bischoff and Hogan got there, uh, uh, Bischoff was actually in the pre-tape, and uh, the first take didn't go too well, uh, so we had to redo it. But in that first take, I had yelled, where's the honky-tonk man? I'm the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. And uh, when we had to do the second one, Bischoff told me, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Hart and, and, and you know Jimmy very well. Oh yeah. Uh, he, he he now that he's away from that particular thing down there with the Bischoff, uh, he, he was he was like man. If Jimmy said something, Bischoff would just roll his eyes and then tell Hogan, "No, let's don't do that." And it was, really? so it was a real power puts back and forth, and you know Hogan's kind of bound together with Bischoff because they're they're business partners in different kinds of endeavors and things of that nature. But right. uh, and of course, you know, Bischoff makes sure Hogan gets a big fat paycheck and never has to wrestle. So, uh, hey, how do you get a contract where you can go wrestle for other people like he did in Canada, and, and you come back and you don't even wrestle on the the TV <laughs> show that you're supposed to? Be? I don't understand that. I don't know. I just I, I don't I don't understand it. I'd like uh, to get that kind of contract too. <laughs> let me let me let me show up and let me show up in a back brace and just not, not work for these guys. There's nothing wrong with having a back brace, but I mean, when he went to Canada, he didn't wear the, his NWO stuff or his Black Hollywood Hogan. He he was back doing the old huckster, you know, just trying to sell T-shirts and stuff and gimmicks. <laughs> a lot of gimmicks. I, I love I love these shoot interviews, and I'm glad you guys oh. sit and watch some of them because uh, in the early days I, there were so many guys that I I could I could you know talk about. Now there's so many that they're they're all gone and passed away or or right. totally retired. So I, I've run out of material now for these kind of things, and you know <laughs> TNA. TNA provides me with the, at least a little bit of stuff to talk about. And, oh, yeah, and, uh, and I can't wait to hear any of mo most of that. As a matter of fact, Tonky, and I, I feel like I keep cutting you off because I, you know, I'm such a big Honky Tonk Man fan, and I just got so much to say. I tried to get on – we tried to work out getting on your show a, a while back, but the timing just never worked, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, finally be on the show, but enough of that getting sidetracked back to what I was uh, – actually trying to say, uh, one of your shoot interviews, uh, I'm sure you remember it because it was one of the craziest ones, it was you, the Iron Sheik, and New Jack, all three oh. together, I believe it was for Rob Fine. 
the police came and we, there was so oh it was a uh, I, well, I, I that was <laughs> That I'd say amazing. my most memorable part about that one, Honky, was uh, uh, somewhere before the police came in, before you guys got super rowdy, this was yep. it just picked up, and uh, I believe New Jack had mentioned the word, the, the name Jeff Jarrett. And yep, then that all set started. Cheek off. Oh, yeah, that set <laughs> Cheek off. It ended up everybody mooning uh, the camera to, yeah. towards Jeff Jarrett. And I thought it was hilarious. Sanjay th- Dutt thought it was hilarious. And we, you know, we did, Honky. We had to show Jeff Jarrett because we thought it was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, Interesting enough, Sanjay and I showed him. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure it had nothing to do with it, but neither one of us worked for the company anymore. Well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey. And, you know, you know, Jeff's reply to watching it, all he could say was, oh, Wayne Ferris. <laughs> yep. Well, <that's... laughs> uh, at least he knows my real name. So, <laughs> but uh, gosh, that's uh, that's the that new Jack thing and uh, with the chic, uh, it got really out of hand. Yes, it did. Uh, I, I've I've passed on. Uh, I've gone beyond that now. I've, I've grown in the business to not be pulling my pants down like that. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, I think I think there was a steamboat moment in there also too. And oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, so, I, some of it might have got on the cutting room floor. I think the part where she couldn't get his pants pulled up. Uh, I don't, yeah, I think that, they, that made it. That made it because Eric Sims had to pick it up for him. Eric Sims. Oh. Had to... <laughs> Unbelievable oh. stuff. Oh, some really was, stuff. I suggest everybody listening go buy that. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, it is. It's really something else. And uh, oh yeah. Well, well, you know. Well, you're with Ring of Honor now, so they have you kind of contractually tied up where you can't go do those things. But sooner or later, you'll be doing them. Uh, you'll you'll be doing all these things. And uh, you know, they they pay you a decent payday to do them. And all you do is knock guys. I mean, heck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, you know, uh, it this. Uh, if you listen to some of these radio shows. We have a, uh, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get you to do him for us. We we have this ongoing thing about Ric Flair because it seems like every time we we think he's out of the picture, he he's he's, he's like a hillbilly Jim said it best one time about Chief J Strongbow. He said he's like a dandelion. He said you can chop him down, but if you give him a little sunshine and water, he'll pop right back up. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Uh, Steve, do you have that clip? Do you have a flair thing? Can we play that for Jake so he can hear this? Yes, sure. Just, just a little bit of it. For the last five years, you've been calling me saggy ass, and I've had enough of it. Do you understand? I'm the nature boy, Ric Flair. I'll give you respect, but you give me respect, you son of a bitch. Russo is working under the table for a wreck man like he has been for the last decade to keep each and every other company down. You hear what I'm saying? It's a bond shell right now. Woo! <laughs> that guy that guy was pretty good. He was pretty pretty good. <laughs> I mean the, the the funny part is I mean <clears throat> In my eyes, only because I, you know, the two people that I looked up to growing up uh, when I was a little kid was Randy Savage and Ric Flair. So, in my eyes, Rick can do no good. I mean, he can do no wrong, but then again, he right. can sometimes do, do no good either. I mean, I no, no matter what, I, I I will always love him because he gave me one of the greatest days of my life. But he can, I mean, he's off the wall, unbelievable. I, I mean. Some of the stories you you wouldn't believe it unless you were there. You know he he's never really changed from way back in thirty five years ago. Uh, yeah. That's what that's what a lot of people don't understand. They 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 think, gosh, this Rick Flair is he's going nuts. He's off the wall. And right, uh, right. I, I, Terry Funk tells me once he, well, uh, we're last year and he says, <laughs> did you see that Rick Flair on TV? He's uh. yelling. Screaming, he's all purple. He's gonna blow a gasket. <laughs> he called Terry Funk called the banana nose. <laughs> Rick, Rick is 
always yelled and screamed and turned purple and 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 gone out and partied and and I, I don't. It, it, the sad thing is, it's his it's his legacy that that's going to suffer. Uh, he's going to be remembered for all the wrong things. When you're living in a glass house, as Ric Flair would say, when you're living uh, in a glass house. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I can't. I, I, we have fun with it here because we like to have fun on this show. Oh yeah, and we have fun with him, and and, and uh, we thought that was the greatest thing. Our friend up in Canada who does all those impersonations uh, did that one for us, and uh, he's pretty good. We got to get me and him together uh, and just just hit record on the camera and just go at it. Yeah, every because, impression uh, we can, everyone. Yeah, you'll have to start doing that in the locker room. Just have uh, have Claudio or have have one of the guys uh, uh, sit there and say, "Hey, man, just turn the camera on and tape this while I do this." And just keep all <laughs> right. That I think I'm, I think I may start that. That's going to be some pretty interesting stuff. Just make your own DVDs. <laughs> the best, of Jay, the best of Jay Lethal, and uh, have everyone. Do you do a Hogan at all? You know, my Hogan's not brother, 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 brother. <laughs> You know, Hogan, is, his is uh, very similar to Savage. I've never done a Hogan one, but uh, his would be very similar to a Savage, I would imagine, just cut back on the raspiness. Yeah, you know, Macho Man, you, you mentioned that he would. He had he had these sayings he had. He, now, mind you, I've watched a lot of Randy's stuff from way back years and years ago when he when he was a, a, a young and upstart like me and because I was living in Nashville and their television show would come into Nashville and different places we would be on the road, and I would see them and see what they were doing because we'd heard so much about Randy and their their insane stuff that they they were doing in their, in their promotion. But he would come up with things like, "Oh yeah, space is the place." Yeah, what does space what does space is the place mean? What does that mean? <laughs> Or, or he would, or he would do this one. Ooh, Hanky Tonk Man, you're in the danger zone now. Oh yeah, that was the danger zone was my favorite. Sometimes uh, the startup promo, he'd ask who, who's in the danger zone right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, you, you did, you did. I tell you what, you did that so, so well, and, and I know that he gave you his blessing on it, which was uh, fantastic and unbelievable. And, uh, you know it. it what it did for you, it set you apart from everyone else that was on that show. It definitely did. And, you know, Honky, I was uh, actually sitting thinking about it. Uh, you know, before I had started, well, let's get to before I had even gotten to TNA, you know. I was trained by a wrestler named Mikey Whitbrick from ECW. And uh, I always, I, I considered myself a good wrestler. I mean, I could do the moves exactly how they were supposed to be done. But, I mean, as far as anything else comes, so I, I mean, like character or, like, trying to get the fans behind me. I mean, the, the fans have to get behind you. They either like you. I mean, it's pretty easier to be a heel. But uh, to be a babyface, the, the, the crowd has to make some kind of connection with you, and that has to be portrayed. I mean, you have to display that through some kind of charisma of your own somehow. And I had none of that, none of it. And I believe that being able to do that whole machismo character actually brought me out of my shell. It made me comfortable. Is what it was. That's the perfect word. It made me comfortable in and out of the ring behind the camera. So, I mean, I attribute most of my success towards uh, that whole machismo character because when I, any fan at any of these indie shows I go to, that's mainly what they say. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear me. Do the Macho Man thing. They they bring up, hey, remember when you and SoCal Val did the whole Elizabeth Savage wedding kind of thing? And I mean, I honestly, I can honestly say <clears throat> that machismo character is what put me on the map, and it actually helped me a great deal in professional wrestling. Well, you know, uh, it's like I tell people: uh, uh, most of the fans out today do not realize that you know I had a twelve-year career as as another character. Uh, before I was ever the honky tonk man, so uh, uh, I, I mean, and and that character, how and why it took off, this one of mine, I I have, I, I can't tell you why. It was obviously it was different, uh, and and it's like you said, it gave me 
creativity to do things on my own and the way I wanted to do it. And that's that's how you develop a character. Mm-hmm. They're they're yeah. they're hurting so much right now uh, with character development that uh, and, and you know that yourself. Oh yeah, you I mean, it's, it's something. It's something you have to be comfortable doing. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's the main problem I think that that company struggles with when it comes to what the X division is because. I mean, it's obviously the X Division put the, that company on the map. It's it's what got the interest. It was this crash course new style wrestling. But now you've got uh, you've got guys, the, the upper card guys. You got Hogan and all those guys. They're in the main. They're in a storyline, something to wrap the crowd around instead of just wrestling because Hogan doesn't wrestle, so he has to be in a storyline. You got guys. I mean, th- th- there's a group feuding with each other. I can't remember the name of the group. I don't really watch it too much now that I'm not there. But uh, when it when it comes to the X Division, the, the lower Carter guys, I mean, the, there's no story there. I mean, it's just, uh, okay, the, here comes an X Division match until we get to the main event. I mean, in the WWE, I mean, every single person in the ring has a reason to be in the ring. They have a story. There's something they're in the ring for. It's not just matches thrown together. And I, I think that's what they're missing. Yeah, and, uh, you know, but which WWE, they, they struggle with character development also, I mean, as far as that goes. and To me, one of the key things that, that you said earlier was you were given you were given that freedom to just off the cuff say things and, and do the things that you did with that character. And that's, you know, and obviously you practiced that in the cars and the locker rooms at home when you were away from it you have to really start to live that thing to, oh, yeah. to make it work to make it work and and uh that's what's missing now i i mean the, sure wwe's got 75 guys down in florida right now and they probably got two characters i mean to, right. that's about it everybody's yeah. you know uh, they're just guys with tights on and yeah. uh, the business is it, 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 you know if Ring of Honor gets the business back down to the ground level like they're they're going to do and trying to do, then I think you'll see more character development. In fact, the Ring of Honor's developed had to, more of the characters come out of there and go to WWE than than anywhere else. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, CM Punk's a good example of that. Mm-hmm. He's he's been given the opportunity now to go out and not have to read a script. And, uh, right, and and it shows. It, it yes. shows. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can see it only because I'm a professional wrestler and I, I know what I'm looking for. I don't know if the normal fa- – you know who's always my judge is uh, my family. You would, I mean, they go to most of my shows, and most people would think that my family is just natural wrestling fans because I'm a wrestler, but they're, they're not. They care less about wrestling. Hello? Yes, you still have oh, with you? Sorry, yeah, Okay. They could care less about wrestling unless I'm involved. And uh, before I got to TNA, uh, my sister, who was not a wrestling fan, uh, she actually wanted to order one of the pay-per-views to watch it. That's before I got there. And now she wouldn't be caught dead watching it. <laughs> well, not too many people are watching it. So <laughs> it's like I said earlier, there are they, are they are they still in business? I mean, <laughs> no. but but anyway, you know the thing about the other organizations other than WWE, there has to be and there needs to be always needs to be some place for guys to go out and and perfect their craft. And and oh, yeah. sometimes sometimes you can't do it on an independent show because you know yourself some of these independent shows are run so horribly they're so terrible I mean it's like I said somebody asked me about the ring I said I don't know I don't even get in it <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but there uh, TNA offers and Ring of Honor offers uh, young fellows in the business and fellows that's been around a while. A place to continue to work and 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 work on and develop a character and uh, you know TNA gave you that opportunity with the the, the macho thing and and oh, yeah. it worked it it really worked out for you and you you learned a lot about the the actual wrestling business by doing a getting a character over. Definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, I would say the biggest thing that I learned from them though is how to handle getting released. <laughs> 
and, and, uh, and hockey, I, I say that in a joking way, but, you know, and, and partly I'm a little serious because at that point in time, TNA was the biggest thing that I had ever done. And I yeah. didn't see myself, I don't know if I was naive or uh, just so excited, but I didn't see myself ever leaving TNA. I, I never saw, there was no end in sight for me, which was pretty stupid of, of a way to look at it. But uh, w- once I got released, I, I almost felt like you know my whole world just came crashing down. What am I going to do? Uh, I, I bought a house not too long ago. I'm thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then, uh, actually, I don't know if you're uh, how good of friends you are with Terry Taylor, but uh, he actually gave me a call, and he said, you know, look, this is not the end of the world, you know. I've been fired plenty of times, and look at me. It, <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> yeah, things where. The, the world's not over, and I mean that's some good advice for any indie worker out there. Listen, I mean the world's not over if you get fired. I mean there's, there's so many people been fired and rehired, and it's unbelievable. Well, I can tell you this: I have been fired. I told Jim Ross at uh, Cauliflower Alley this year. I said, Jim, you know, you and I have something in common, and he looked at me and said, "What's that?" I said, "Well, we've both been fired from the same company twice." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Well, I, he said, well, I was fired." He said, "I got you beat. I've been fired three times from WWE." So I uh, said, "Well, I, I said, well, I quit three times and I got uh, fired three times. So, and I've been fired from WCW. So, uh, I, I, we, we all we all have something in common. Let's put it that oh, way. Yeah. Uh, there's there's not one person out there that's better than anybody else. That I mean, correct. that's just how it is. We that's we're true. all on a level playing. Because oh, yeah. when it's over, it's over. <laughs> they pull the plug on you, you're gone. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but that, that, you know, you talk about not try, trying to trying to get away from somewhere. That that poor Gail Kim. Uh, oh. They would now they won't let her go. <laughs> <laughs> she she's doing. I I feel bad. It's one of those. It's almost like one of those situations where, oh well, we know you'd be happier somewhere else, so we're not going to let you go. Yeah, we'll just just keep her around. Uh, yeah. And, and then the one girl, she she uh, she gets fired to, on a Friday and shows up at a Monday Night Raw on a Monday night, thinking they're going to let her back in the building. <laughs> <laughs> we we have fun on this show, Jane. I, I'm I, so I love it. I love it. I, I'm so glad that uh, we were able to get you to come on now and make sure. I know I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, make sure you say hello to Frankie and those guys and everyone no over the ring. No problem. I, I've done no a little problem. work with Ring of Honor where I showed up and did a little angle in the ring with them in Chicago once. They had a great crowd. I mean, you guys are drawing good houses. And, and, and that's the best part that you're doing now is that you're actually getting to wrestle in front of more than 200 people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, hey, as, Mick, as as Mick Foley said, working for TNA was like wrestling in an empty building. <laughs> <laughs> now that's Mick's words, not mine. Oh man, oh man. You know, Huggy, uh, a, a good friend of mine, very good friend of yours. I think he's more of a friend of yours than mine. Uh, actually, wanted me to tell you hello, Pat Kenny. Oh gosh, what's he doing now? He's still an agent. At uh, TNA. Really? Yeah. You know, you know, uh, he's got a great story to tell too uh, about, <laughs> you know. Oh, I've heard them all. Trust me. Uh, well, uh, tell you what, uh, <laughs> there's not a, there's not a, uh, a better guy around that that that's in a position to be part of a talent relations guy than than him, because he has had uh, as many ups and downs as anybody. And oh and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't. Even, I didn't know he was still with that company. I know one time that he was. He thought he was gone from there or something. They, and then he they, was, they did let him go. They got rid of him at one point, and then they brought him back. Came back. He. I worked an independent show with him, and he said, "I don't know if I'm still there or not." <laughs> <laughs> but he is a great guy. Great, great, he is, great. He is. You know, I'm thinking yeah. about being coming, becoming a regular on the Honky Tonk Man Radio. Well, I don't know if, it would, if it's going to enhance your career at all, but uh, there's, there's, we we have about sixty or seventy thousand people every Thursday night listening in, so uh, you're heard around the world, and you can tell the fans how to get in.
things of that nature. Let That's the fans right, so. know how to contact to, if they want to see you somewhere out here in America or Canada or the United Kingdom. Okay, and uh, Bill Barron's actually is handling every kind of booking situation or booking inquiry you could possibly have, and uh, you can email him at showbiz at AOL.com. That's S-H-O-W-B-I-S at AOL.com. And, you know, this is this, the, the age of the social networking, isn't it, Honky? It is, and if you're so, not involved in it, you're going to be left behind. Oh, yeah. So speaking of which, I also have a Twitter, and uh, my Twitter name is at little at sign the lethal J. And it's not just the letter, letter J, it's actually spelled out, so it would be T-H-E-L-E-T-H-A-L-J-A-Y. I'm on the Twitter, I'm on there J. all the time. Yep. Okay. Jay, thank you so much for joining us on Shake, Rattle, and Roll. We've had a heck of a time, and uh, uh, just keep doing what you're doing, and uh, don't hit the ropes too hard. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for having me, Anki. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.